Okay, everybody, it is live at 5, March 16th, 2023, here in the ETF Think Tank. Happy hour. Uh, thrilled that everybody is here. My name is Dan Weisskopf. I'm the ETF professor and also lead ETF strategist for the ETF Think Tank. Um, we are thrilled to have Davis here and Peter Sackman and Dodd Kitsley um, for the show today. We'll have some great conversations about the financials, which is basically top of mind for everyone. So with that, I'm going to kick it off to who wants to take it? David? It's Cynthia. Yeah. All right, David, it's fine. How's it going, everyone? David Chikansky here, fellow portfolio manager with uh, this bunch on the title side, focusing on the SoFi gig economy, be your own boss ETF and, and amplify inflation fighting ETF. Uh, today will be focused on the financials, as Dan mentioned, top of mind, and uh, very excited to hear what the experts at Davis have to say on this and give us some insights. And um, thank you for joining us. And I'll kick it off to Cynthia. Hey, everybody. Cynthia Murphy, head of research for the tank. Um, as always, favorite day of the week. Thank you all for joining us. It's going to be a great conversation. Mike, introduce yourself and our guests. Awesome. So uh, excited to have my friends from Davis Advisors back here. Um, very timely. I don't know any other active managers in the ETF space that focus on financials, and I can't think of something that's more important to think about right now. I, I wore my Credit Swiss shirt. This is Sharks being held up by uh, floaties. Um, uh, it's been a weird one. It's been a crazy week, uh, you know, um, and we got lots to cover. The celebration word today is going to be balance sheet. Some of us have one. Some of us don't anymore. Uh, <laughs> um, and as usual, if you'd like to come up and be a speaker or ask questions, just hit us up in the chat or the Q&A. We'll promote you up and and get you an audience here. Um, and as always, we thank you for being part of the Think Tank. Uh, Davis Advisors is a sponsor of the Think Tank and has been very helpful in us getting out research and, and advice and software and all that fun stuff over the years. So we're thrilled to have them. And with that, let me introduce my friend, Dodd Kitsley. Um, Dodd, fire away. Well, thank you guys for so much for having us here. Uh, the partnership and working with you has been uh, really just pretty amazing for us. Uh, since we launched our ETF six years ago, uh, but I've worked with you guys longer than that. Uh, I'm National Director at Davis Advisors, helped launch the ETF uh, business over there, uh, work uh, directly with advisors, and it's really an honor today to introduce my good friend uh, and colleague, Peter Sackman. Uh, Peter's been with the firm uh, over 25 years, uh, served as portfolio manager for many strategies, uh, one of the most brilliant minds that I know, I think you're going to really enjoy uh, hearing his comments. Uh, and our firm is research driven. We're bottom up, uh, which I know is unique in the ETF industry still, uh, though becoming maybe a little bit less. Uh, we've specialized in financials. Chris Davis has managed the uh, uh, financial fund, uh, which our ETF is uh, an analog of very, very similar exposure. Chris has been doing that for uh, 32, 33 years. So uh, we have a lot to say uh, here and no one better to articulate it than uh, my good friend, Peter Sackman. So uh, Peter, I'll let you introduce yourself. Great. Well, no, thanks everyone. I, uh, you know, I, I realize I don't look like a Peter Sackman, you know, when I look at my name on the Zoom, usually I don't look at myself in the mirror very much at all. But in this case, you know, I wanted to give a little bit of background. I've been at Davis since 1997. I hail from South Korea as, as, as a uh, original country. Uh, I grew up in the States in an American family. I'm a French citizen as well. And basically, my roles at Davis have been both portfolio management as well as uh, institutional um, uh, client services uh, uh, globally. So that's my background. Um, I would characterize myself as uh, more as a generalist, and um, I'm here uh, happily to discuss sort of what's on everyone's minds, uh, which is specifically in the epicenter of today's news and these days news, uh, specifically in financials. So we have a long history in financials going back to the 19, uh, really 50s. Uh, within the Davis family, and uh, I'm happy to share any perspectives that I I, I have uh, uh, that might be helpful. Yeah, so Peter, 
bring us up to speed. I, I, you know, everybody's living this dream right now, right? But bring us up to speed, if you would, on you know your perspective on what has happened um, mm -hmm. with your deep knowledge. Sure. I mean, I, I think the you know the key points so far in the narrative have to do, of course, with the um, the failure of both Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Financial in um, so Silicon Valley Bank, obviously in sort of Santa Clara, the Bay Area, and uh, Signature in in, uh, in New York. I think Silicon Valley Bank is probably the the the, the more um, uh, prominent case of what we're looking at here in general. The uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, this this is a bank that on certain metrics may have looked, um, if not safe, then uh, reasonably run, and I, I think it's taken the the market and certainly shareholders um, uh, by surprise to see the sudden collapse of this bank, and of course we have I think attendant and related stresses overseas in Credit Suisse. Uh, it's worth asking the question is this sort of a micro issue or is this a macro issue right and i would say that in the narrative that gets less prominence versus say the crisis itself uh the speed and decisiveness with which the crisis is being met is also uh sort of historic in nature and i think that that's something that i think both of those uh the cause and the effect the um the the, the actions and the activities uh, the occurrences and the responses um, is uh, is a very very instructive process to go through. Um, it's unpleasant at some level, but at, at the same time, um, I think that uh, I think actually that they're encouraging uh, sort of signs of foot. But, but so to to that point, the speed of it all, not only how quickly it happened, how quickly we reacted, and how much we've been talking about it, like everything else in the world doesn't matter right now. It's just this conversation, at least on any social media channel and in the media in general. Uh, is it really, does it deserve this much panic or are we just adding panic to the panic because, I don't know, you, the word bank run makes everybody nervous. So you start running, even though you don't know where you're running to. So did we, is it self-induced pain or is it was really warranted? I, I think that the market is reacting um, to some extent rationally in the sense that, not, not in the sense of panning all stocks and financials, because I think that that is overdone. I think what's more rational, however, in behavior at the market level is drawing distinctions between different entities, or at least attempting and seeking to draw distinctions company by company, as opposed to running with a narrative that across the board and across the world says the banking system all around the world cannot be trusted. That would be a terrible narrative, uh, if even partially true. Um, I happen to be of the mind that this is a bit more a combination of, if you understand what's happening circumstantially at the micro level, what is why it has happened, as well as the what I'll call mac macro prudence that is being applied and implemented from a regulator and top down perspective from governments. Um, I think when you look at those facts, net net, uh, I would say that there's some pretty good bargains out there. But at the same time, I would uh, advise people to really uh, be with advisors and be with investment managers who know the space well. This is it's not a uh, it's a space that can make fortune for you over generations. However, it is not uh, a trivial sector, uh, and it's not an uh, it's not a category of investment that lends itself to casual observers, if you will. So what what we saw was like a, a duration mismatch and a very funky time with like an inverse yield curve and lots of flows going in deposits. What are the the risks going forward? And I'll I'll tell you what my biggest fears are, right? We have the duration side of this, and then the other side yeah. of it is the credit side of their balance sheet. Balance sheet, right. by the way, please. I think that's the first time we said balance sheet. Oh, that's so a drunk. Right. And is that the commercial real estate space? And then also like just how do banks prepare for a world where like Twitter can cause them to lose 25% of their deposits. Like, what do you do? <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'll ask you both. Yeah. I'll, I'll take both both questions. The first is about, I mean, I think the the asset liability and the duration mismatch can be can be solved. I really do think so. And I'm not sure to what extent it will be market directed or to some extent policy and government 
um, influenced, right? In other words, there is no rule to say that the Federal Reserve could not adjust to some extent to its, you know, to uh, its ability, um, the a bit of the yield curve, frankly. And I think that that um, that is something that is absolutely in the realm of possibility. I don't know timing wise or whether that will be necessary, but it does factor, of course, into the thinking broadly speaking as to the you know the the wisdom of certain policy stances right now, right? Because we've got, of course, the twin mandate at the Fed between price stability on the one hand, and that has been the 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 key issue so far that's been highlighted. But of course, now out of nowhere, we're dealing with possibly the other um, of the twin mandate, which is uh, employment, right? And there's employment and there's price stability. So let's just say in the middle, there is a question of um, price of, uh, of asset quality, right? Uh, question mark. I think having been in the commercial real estate you know, sector myself directly, um, I think it's going to be fairly local in terms of how you size that up. Um, and I think that that's mainly because, you know, the uh, you know the local dynamics will reflect, among other things, the actual employment picture as it is evolving in those areas. So if you took downtown Philadelphia, for example, one of the things I used to do, I would say, you know, you know, you take out a, num a number of journals and you say, what is happening in terms of employers going there or leaving first? How big is the impact likely to be? Um, what does that do? Are, are companies shedding employees or companies growing? And you put all of that together uh, with general sort of economic uh, and then um, financial data showing sort of credit uh, losses and things like that, um, if not uh, losses and certainly provision trends, right? Uh, so it overall, I would say that's, that is a facet and, and a, a, a number of line items that you need to, to my point earlier, you need to really understand the vocabulary of what's being presented to you. A lot of this information is presented to you uh, fairly real time uh, in public disclosures and in public documents. You, you can um, deduce a lot from the trends. You can deduce a lot from what's happening in one major metropolitan area that could affect another if there's employment crossover and transmission effects. So I've always viewed commercial real estate first and foremost as a local business and then a property business. But then there are some macro forces and, and, and burdens as well that we have to take into account. And if we do see uh, a deterioration, let's just say, in the jobs number, you know, that's that's something that usually is a huge input into just credit quality in general, whether it's, you know, sort of on the consumer end or whether it's commercial real estate or anything in between. And I think that that's 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 important to um bear in mind. And it's also very important to to, to keep an eye on. So that is that's my my view on uh, on the asset side of the balance sheet and i, I think that that's um you know it's it's going to be a slow moving uh process and right now i know that the mood and the sentiment is a bit negative and down um but you know that which does not um overwhelm the capital replenishment right ability of the country of investors um there's a lot that when you follow the whole life cycle of a say a property or portfolio of properties, depending on their local economies, you can begin to see sort of where green shoots, you know, or, or where safeguards and uh, backstops can be employed, where it would make sense for other investor classes to come in and do that. Or, you know, usually, usually it is some type of investor class. So commercial real estate may in fact go through a tough spot relative to uh, historical. But that being said, I also know that there's a lot of uh, sort of money between uh, domestic, international, and even sovereign type of investors that, frankly, um, might chomp at the bit at the right price for some of these commercial real estate assets. So it's, it, it, it depends on where you are in the cycle and where you began and where you end in your investment. All right. So, David, before I jump in, did you have something you wanted to cover on this question or is it something else? No. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. So I'm going to jump in with, uh, yeah, I hear you talking about how Davis has been investing here 50 years. I know you guys are generational. Um, I, uh, I'm was at a, the New York stock exchange the other day, the day when everybody thought credit Swiss was toast. Um, and I got interviewed with like three or four other people and I looked around and I realized I was the only other person there 
that had lived through 08 and they asked me, you know, is this different? Uh, what, what lessons did you learn from 08 that could be applied here? And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm going to ask you that lessons learned question, but what I've seen already is the Fed learned some lessons. In 08, it took them eight months to react. It took them eight minutes right. to react this time. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if it was a good reaction. They may have just nationalized the entire banking system. We'll see. Uh, but they reacted. That's their lesson learned. Uh, what lessons have you taken from this, this current crisis? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you stress test a situation that is uh, full of unknowns, the, the the first thing that you try to do is come up with a framework for evaluating what, where you are, you know, and in terms of orders of magnitude, I went through, say, in my mind, uh, is this a savings and loan crisis over again, right? And I think about that, and I think about ultimately where that ended up through a learning by doing process in the Resolution Trust Corporation, okay, so in other words, recapping the banks, cleaning up, consolidating, et cetera. And we lost well over a thousand lenders in that uh, in that period. So that was that was probably the the worst from standpoint of community banking that we'd seen in a long time. I would say in 1998, we had long-term capital and sort of that, that scare. Um, that actually has some parallels to today in the sense that as of four o'clock today, you saw a consortium of about 11 you know, major banks um, contribute $30 billion collectively to First Republic Bank to relieve stress there. And, you know, that reminds me a little bit about some of the- And it's still down 21%. Like, oh, no, of course. Right? Yeah, like, I, I mean, just, I, just I put that in perspective, it. right? Like, they, they just got $30 billion and people don't believe it. I'm sorry, I had to just say that because so, I'm oh, no, staring okay. it on the screen. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, see what, we'll see what the follow through is like, right? Because um, sometimes- you know, sometimes it's sort of that once bitten, twice shy, I'll, I'll wait and see, maybe maybe see how that situation evolves organically. Um, but I think the orientation and the spirit behind a public-private hybrid uh, response was just what we needed, frankly, thus far. And it shows, among other things, that there will be a fire break in this process. They are going to ring fence the situation to the best of their abilities collectively. I like that coordination between, you know, that 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 coordination and not opposing views or opposing tactics or interests, incentives between the two. At some level, you could even call it patriotic, but it's definitely the system before all else, right? Depositors before all else, the system before all else, because without that trust factor, then there is no such thing as um, distinction between big and small bank at some level. It may just be a question of whether the banking model, right, overall is something people can trust. So, and, and if you don't stop it quickly, and what happens is it's not just what happens here in the States. We now have global capital markets that are inter interconnected. People who live halfway around the world, if you think that people here in the United States have trouble understanding the Greek that's coming out right in, in these news articles, think about um, how they respond in other cultures, other countries, other situations. Um, it could be it could have ramifications that are much, much you know, wider. So that's why I think it's very encouraging. And it reminds me of 98 more than 0809. Now, why? Also, it's because I think the problem can be dealt with. I do. I actually think that it's not the the um, not having a major systemic at the big banks leverage problem again, right? This is not, you know, Lehman at 40 times lever. It's not Bear at 32. It's not, you know, even, even Merrill in the 20s. So what I see this as is it's not bite sized but it, it is manageable in the context of how much healthy capital uh, that has not been destroyed is still out there to, you know, to, to participate in the rescue. And that is a huge difference between now and 0809. And it's one of the reasons why I think the regeneration process could be a lot quicker and a lot more um, effective. And it's, it's also one of the reasons why, to Cynthia's point earlier, you know, is the market overdoing it? I think in some cases they're they're absolutely have opened up some company specific inefficiencies. Absolutely. And that's another reason why I, I happen to be personally and professionally a proponent of active management, because I think, you know, in this particular sector, more than any others, investing really is the art of the specific. It can be tremendous and uh, very attractive. Um, if you if you have some expertise in it, and I think that's also a nice competitive advantage for those in the field who study financials over decades versus those who are bright but may not have the historical background. Mm -hmm. 
So, Peter, on that same uh, vein, you know, anytime something crazy happens or a new crisis happens, the first thing we do is look to the past. Has this happened before? Like to this example, is this like 08 or is it like 98? Or it, and, um, you know, I never understood the saying, you know, history doesn't repeat it often rhymes. I actually don't know what that means in practical terms. If you're actually trying to make decisions, I don't know how good a rhyme is, but uh, this exercise of trying to figure out, have we lived through the through this before and what to do? I mean, if you look at just this week, we can't even agree whether it was a bailout or not a bailout. So, I mean, do we even agree enough on the historical precedence to make any meaning of it that is useful um, universally or, you know, this exercise of looking for that historical precedence, how useful it is actually on any time we face a new crisis? I think it's useful in a few different respects. First is useful to see and to gauge whether the actions on the part uh, in the response of regulators in the government have evolved and learned just as private sector, right? So that's the first thing. Second question is, has regulation been a good net positive or net negative for the industry since 0809? Now, based on the, the sort of too big to fail, let's keep everything safe principle, um, it has definitely kept the system much more secure and much more resilient on the whole than it would have been had we let just animal spirits dictate where you draw the risk line, right? Um, I also think that companies now and financials are beginning to learn that, um, you know, you make more over a generation than losing less, right? And that less losing, losing a lot in financials can be terminal. So in any business that has any leverage whatsoever. So that's important. And then the last thing I'd say is it's a reminder. It's a reminder of what managements can do. We often herald in this country and and uh, uh, give hero worship to who we believe are the leaders, thought leaders uh, and uh, business leaders in the country. The, um, the fact of the matter is that some of these banks that have gone up uh, in, in duress, there, there are a lot of conscious business model related decisions that created that situation in the first place, right? So in other words, if you looked at I mean, SVB, I mean, uh, I think 2022 year end, they had about 209 billion in total assets. Okay. They had about 170, 175 billion in quote unquote deposits. So on a loan to deposit basis, you would have thought on a simple screen that it was more attractive or safer to some extent, all things being equal, than JP Morgan at sort of one and a half. The answer is the composition, uh, you know, to David's point, the composition of the, the balance sheet, well, there's a drink again. Um, the composition mm -hmm. of the assets and the liabilities um, is all important. And the fact of the matter is plain vanilla assets, uh, in the, I'm sorry, um, deposits, probably in the spirit of regulation in the past has been deemed uh, unfit and inappropriate to link, right, directly to, by the, at the hip, um, to risk-seeking, risk-based capital, right? We have, I mean, that is the spirit ultimately of what happened in Glass-Steagall. That's the, the spirit of a lot of Dodd-Frank. And, um, you know, the idea of not basically uh, risking a portion of the balance sheet that, that, that is supposed to be reserved for the benefit in the whole institution, right? And the benefit of all depositors. I think that that compact was effectively broken, you know, in this particular situation. I don't know people's intentions, or uh, whether it was, you know, uh, knowingly or unwittingly, but in effect and de facto, the, the result is that, that risk assets and risk capital was linked ultimately to the same balance sheet as, as depositors that um, probably would have viewed it as more of an institution for core deposits, just with a little bit more yield, right? And I think that that is possibly and probably going to, uh, you know, to be very, very heavily scrutinized, whereas the big banks, you know, that was a focus since 08, 09. Um, I think that the era of light touch for the mid-sized banks is perhaps over. You, Go down. You, make, you, you make me sad when you say that, what you just said about the, the mid-sized banks, mm -hmm. but, but here's my question. And, you know, I'm the guy who always talks about how structure matters. And your firm is all about active management. You know, what is your team doing at, you know, under these conditions 
to evaluate things and understand what's what's going on. This is the point, right? Where where active really can stand out. You know, are you calling managements? Or are you just going deeper into the balance sheets? Balance sheet, everybody. Yeah, right. Throw that in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're we're doing we're really doing all of the above, and um, you know, it's uh, it's a moment where all hands are on deck, of course, but. I think that the, the the key fact for us is that active management doesn't just work in real time. It doesn't work in real response only to what's happening in the news flash at that day. You know, we started looking at this problem in terms of the duration mismatch um, early last year to mid last year became um, very, uh, I think, very cautious about things in terms of where we placed the incremental dollar based in, in part on this mismatch that was emerging. So. I, I fail to see how bank CEOs and bank managements could miss the trend, right? And um, just even if you were to say the cone of probabilities include interest rate rises on the short end, we're pretty much at historical. We're not exceeding that, right, in, on a normalized basis. So it just seems wildly you know, sort of curious to me how that could have not been factored into just the basic management of the companies. Um, so I think what we do is we try to uh, triangulate as best we can, and we also try to anticipate the best we can. And I think in this case, there's a reason why we are much, much heavier in large banks, in, you know, the strategically important financial institutions. We're uh, much larger in, say, uh, property casualty reinsurance and diversified financials. And we have some regional exposure that is really hand-picked and it's, it's very surgical in nature. So that's how we've been positioned. And so in terms of portfolio changes, we have not really had to change that much because we have been, I think, on much higher ground. And you know, to point I tried to make earlier too is that there has been a degree of differentiation, at least between the best and 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 the worst so far. Um, and I'd say the last thing that we are cognizant of as active managers is that you have all these choices, and to say that, you know, once in a while you have. To to, or maybe perennially, you have to, in order to cut off the left tail extreme of risk, you have to forego the right tail extreme of return potential too. You just do. Because that, if it's analogous to um, excessive risking, uh, it, it is an all or nothing bet. It's a bet the farm you know, um, proposition. And if your probabilities are off, even just by fractions of a, of a percent, you can be at zero. So if you want to try to stave off even the possibility of going to zero under even the most adverse circumstances, uh, it teaches you, I think, to ride between different lines, let's just say, different extreme lines than, than some others who may not have had that, that perspective. So a lot of people have been saying this is, as you guys astutely pointed out and, and had in your portfolio, even heading into this, an overweight for the big banks, so a reason for people to move a significant amount of cash to the big banks, the rationale for keeping over 250K on the regional bank is kind of gone with the wind. But I, one question that I have not, I'm curious why more people haven't spoken about this is a lot of these platform banks that don't have actual physical locations, mm -hmm. they too have FDIC insurance without actually naming mm -hmm. names on them. And so like, if you're playing in the 250 and under realm, isn't it? also a game of at that point cost of customer acquisition so aren't these platform banks just as big of a threat to the regional banks as are the big players i, I it's a great point and i think that some of this uh so-called disruptive um sort of alternate bank kind of channel um that uh obviously and should be looked at very carefully as to what the the implications of what that would do to the system if it got much larger and then went belly up, right? That that should be absolutely this is this is a moment where you should basically look across the structure, the existing current structure of the financing spigot and the financing arm of the United States, and ask yourself the, the question: which business formats are allowed versus not allowed? Second, if for the business formats that are allowed in banking, which ones how, what what safeguards do you protect, put in place, et cetera? Um, it seems to me sac 
you know, that posits have been treated as sacrosanct thus far. But let's face it, if you had an alternate, you know, kind of payment banking system or platform that grew, you know, wildly to uh, huge proportions, um, it would be, you know, it, it, I'm not sure that you would necessarily see the same consortium of 11 big banks coming together to, to you know, to infuse capital into that, right? So that's something where it reminds me a little bit of some of the the on the come, you know, speculative stuff that we saw in the late 90s, early 2000s. And, you know, Shelby Davis and I were talking back then about the effects of uh, on psychology and investor behavior towards millennia. It was very interesting. He said that in the previous millennium start, you know, there was a wild, you know, sort of euphoria, right? These expectations of new, new, new. He pointed that out because Shelby was a history major in addition to being a great financial expert. Um, so, we we looked at that and said, well, these new economy, this, the new, you know, bank with new dot coms, you know, at the end of the day, it it just it kind of comes back to, you know, how, you know, how 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 viable and 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 um your your business model is through a whole life cycle, right? Or a business cycle or multiple business cycles. And I think if there's any question at this point at the margin of whether some of the newer concepts, because one one could Posit that SVB had a newer concept of business model, right? Newer format. I think all of those formats will be um, heavily scrutinized, and it's only a matter of time, in my opinion, before you know what's in, what's out, and also in between what it will cost you effectively de facto to ensure your business practices, right? Somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And they had a newer format, but they did not have the newest format of like no actual physical structures. And that, you know, like a lot of these platforms have $20 costs of customer acquisitions versus hundreds right. of dollars for all the banks. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, Mike. Yeah. yeah. But if deposits, if deposits were to become fully insured or the deposit level for the FDIC were to double, triple, quadruple, okay, then what, what would, what would prevent well, I mean, then the the FDIC would have to basically be funded as such as an insurance entity at that scale, right? And where would that money come from? Most likely, it would come from depository institutions themselves. Um, I, I think that just like you have certain charges in place for capital ratios for the big banks, if you're a CFI, um, that sort of that sort of uh, approach could also be implemented if the depository framework were to change, deposit protection framework were to change such that all deposits up to say a million dollars became fully insured, um, you would look at that almost like an insurance type of vehicle and say, to what extent will that cost the premiums to the, to the lenders? Okay, so uh, let's go to Lily, then Ray, and then I'm gonna ask a, a question from Eric in the chat, because I think he's on the move. So Lily, go ahead, unmute and get in the conversation. Okay. Um, my question is, if the FDIC would uh, cover all the insured deposit, where are they going to get the money to cover the ones that are not insured? I heard sure. that the, they might be able to borrow for, from the Federal Home Loan Bank, and they would have to use properties um, to, you know, uh, as collateral to, mm. to borrow money. Is that going to be enough? I think it's uh, it's an interesting point, and I think that the the answer really lies in a little bit of um, what is a moving target conversation within sort of the the powers that be doors uh, walls. Um, but I, I I believe that there will be certainly the opportunity to be a little creative and flexible in terms of the mechanisms that are used. Right? I mean, just like if we run into um, some type of fiscal situation in the United States. Sometimes there are sort of emergency measures or you know extraordinary measures that can be taken at the central bank, things like that. Um, so if at the end of the day, that 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 actually brings me back to my last point about you know what are the cost of deposits, right? And it's not just what are the cost of deposits for you know for the banks, but also what are the cost of deposits for the FDIC. And if you say that basically your liability right, or that you're responsible for, the contingent liability has gone up 30%, 50%, then you 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 do have to uh, not only uh, you sort of be uh, funded for that, um, and maybe not in real time, 
but you do have to work towards a, a, a structure and a, and a system, a framework by which the FDIC is insured and protected, right? And funded. And that that is really the sort of the, the, the cycle that we need to make sure happens uh, in terms of the coordination between public private sector um, sort of initiatives. I, I think we are starting from a good point of learnings from 0809. Are we there yet for this particular you know, event and situation? No, we're not. But I do think that we have uh, we're at a good starting point where this would be sort of an incremental um, sort of uh, uh, improvement and enhancement set of enhancements rather than a wholesale, you know, out of the blue novel, you know, leap, leap far into the future type of uh, challenge. I actually think we can handle this. Thank you. And I also want to make a comment that I think a lot of people just didn't understand that in 08, 09, the, it was uh, poor underwriting you know, for mm -hmm. housing market. And this yeah. time is asset liability mismatch. Mm -hmm. that, that is that is true. Um, and also, you know, I would say there's another force at work here, which is, you know, the, the banks that were run as go-go growth institutions for previous years, um, they appeal to a certain class, not only of shareholders, but also of customers, right? In other words, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, the reason they pursued venture capital in part was because venture capital pursued them, right? And it also was a niche in the market that in addition to being highly lucrative for a time, was also something where it would provide growth in a non-traditional banking way, strategy way. Because the truth is, even without this crisis, before the crisis, to build a bank of the magnitude, the diversification involved, the controls involved, the systems, technology, budget, branches, everything, and the oversight um, of JP Morgan. You know, my dad worked for a chemical bank for 20 years. And, you know, JP Morgan is the amalgam of eight to 10 plus banks, really, if you think about it, right? So, chemical merged with Manny Hanny, they merged with Chase, they merged with JP Morgan, and, um, you know, First Bank of Dallas, so First Bank. So, you know, it's just, it's really interesting if you want to have even so far as geographic diversity, right, diversification in your books, um, it is almost impossible to do from a standing start today as a novel sort of bank concept. So you have to go another route if you want to get paid a lot of money. And I think that that's sometimes, you know, when I talk about management decisions, it, it, it management decides a lot of things from accounting practices to how you set up the business, what risks you take, down to, you know, from the risks you decide to take and the business model you choose, you create incentives for your employees. Those incentives drive behaviors. Behaviors ultimately get baked into a certain culture of mindset, right? So that is why you tend to have risk taker CEOs at the home for a long time have risk taking cultures too. And you don't have to predict what the, uh, the timing of, of calamity may be. All you need to know is that the market is not marking properly the embedded built in risk that is in that culture, in that entity, in that business model. And I think that's where you don't have to be precise. It's, it's better to be properly right than precisely wrong in this case, right? So I think that this is a good example of you, even with, with so-called fuzzy cones of probability, you know that this was left tail, extreme left tail vulnerability potentially there. And that had to do with the makeup of the deposits as well as loaning to, on a credit basis, even if it's on working lines, um, loaning to group that even back in my father's day would probably score lower than restaurants in a recession. Right. And I think that's something to bear in mind. I have one last question. I went All into right. a meeting with Chris We're Davis. We're going to let you get away with it because we love you, Lily. So go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, Chris Davis always real enthusiastic about foreign banks. Mm -hmm. Does he still feel the same? Thank you. C certain foreign banks absolutely are almost the model for where the best run U.S. banks could get to one day. And, um, you know, we own uh, in the portfolio a sizable position in a, a bank in Singapore, for example, that in my view is, if not the you know, best bank in the world, certainly in the top three or four. Um, and you can look at it both from a kind of growth of end market standpoint, just organic based on their uh, position vis-a-vis -vis this the super region that's Asia Pacific, 
you could look at it from the vantage point of how what percentage of the populations, these growing populations are underbanked. And you could also look at it from the vantage point of at its current scale, what are its operating margins, right? And it's so interesting that uh, the, you know, the, the, the efficient rate, efficiency ratio, which is really the expense structure, if you will, of these banks, um, you know, in the United States, you're doing pretty well if you have like a 5%, actually. And that would impute um, sort of a gross income margin of 45%, right? It, when you go to certain other jurisdictions that have these terrific digital platforms and digital banking relationships, because that happens to be the generation in which all their customers um, sort of uh, emerged. Well, you have efficiency ratios sometimes north of, uh, well, below 40%, in fact. So that would that would basically imply um, gross income margins of 60 plus percent. So 45% for a great bank in the US versus 60% gross income margin for a bank in Singapore, right? With, by the way, with over 20% capital ratios. So you put it all together and you said, you know, once again, you take that bank and you compare it against a U.S. bank, and furthermore, you compare it against Silicon Valley Bank. And you realize why investing in financials really is the art of the specific. All right, Ray, you're up. <laughs> thanks, everyone, and uh, thanks, Peter and Doc. Um, a couple questions. I'll try to. They're completely different, but I'll try to put them together. First, there was an article. Uh, on uh, out of Bloomberg, John Arthur's last night that had a chart in it that seemed to show that the deposit erosion for the smaller banks is worse than the banking industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I sort of noticed with the with what the Fed has done, looking at the retail uh, advisors in our firm, one of the big things they're doing is pulling money away from particularly smaller banks and either getting those and investing it in treasuries or investing it in the CDs that are offered by the larger banks. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see that as, uh, as any kind of long-term problem or, or what would be your comments on that? And the second question, uh, some data that just came out right before this call, I noticed that the, uh, the term lending facility that the Fed rolled out had about a $12 billion takedown but then the discount window had a $150 billion takedown compared to $7 billion last week. So just in comments mm -hmm. you might have on that. Thanks. Sure, sure. Uh, the first question, uh, on the first question, I would say that if you looked at, say, the last 40 plus years in the industry, with each successive crisis, certainly the SNL um, 0809 and this one, you know, what, what has been the trend, and I think it's an in, 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 uh, inexorable trend has been towards consolidation of market structure. It really has. And I know that, you know, there, there, obviously there are, there are very strong feelings as to whether we should have big businesses get bigger at the expense of smaller businesses in general. I mean, we look at retail, for example, mom and pop shops being replaced by big box. Um, but capitalism, uh, as a way of, um, as a system sometimes does, uh, sort of lead to a degree of plutocracy just by nature. And, uh, you know, Buffett's comment on that as is, 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 is well. But if you look at the other developed economies of the world, most of them have only a handful, maybe three or five national champion banks. And they do have smaller lending institutions as well. But I would say that the market share of the big banks, certainly as a percentage of the total deposits, uh, happens to be enormous relative to the smaller lender, relatively speaking. So is this going to um, result in a further wave or acceleration of the consolidation process? If I had to guess, I would say probably yes, probably yes. It doesn't mean that you could not see the likes of um, sort of mini, you know, super regional mergers, for example. You know, that I think is totally in, in, on the table. Um, there are a lot of businesses out there that are in the good bank category that if they banded together in some rational way, you know, could also form uh, a sort of a mid to, to large size bank that, that may have some of the, the attributes that you might be interested in, you know, from the standpoint of what's already out there, right? Um, your question about the facilities and stuff, well, let's face it. I mean, there's a lot of precautionary movement of money right now. And um, if you saw, I mean, a couple of signals. One is 
I think we want to make sure that there's a strong statement, first of all, in uh, how much is realistically backstopping the problem. That's, that's the first thing. So I'm not surprised by it, um, certainly by the timing. Um, I'm actually not surprised by the, the magnitude, the order of magnitude. You know, when you're talking about uh, over $2 trillion of deposits residing in some of the below the line in terms of the, some of the bigger banks, um, you do want to have, I think, enough firepower to deal with some of the uh, some liquidity movement. Um, the other thing I would say about it is when you look at, say, what the ECB did, you know, by raising 50 basis points, um, you know, the funny thing is that's a that's a pretty strong um, uh, statement, right? I mean, just as the fact that banks like PNC and U.S. Bank Corp participated in an infusion, a $30 billion infusion into First Republic for today, you know, that that usually is not the action of a bank in trouble, right? So, and I think that that's one of the reasons why it was significant that 11 different banks of different sizes contributed, you know, um, so... You know, we shall see, but I do think that the market structure question and the market concentration question is is a good one and probably probably leans towards, you know, more concentration at the top, if only because from a regulatory standpoint, that's where the rule setting has baked, has been baked in the most uh, dramatically. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, Eric, do you want to ask the question? Do you want me to read it for you? I don't know if you're in transit or not. Yeah, I can ask it. Okay. Uh, since, uh, Peter, you're uh, pretty familiar with commercial real estate, uh, number one, which metros are likely to see the biggest correction in office? Uh, I think uh, Bloomberg office reads are down 50% or so from the peak. Uh, mm -hmm. Second, uh, which landlords are most likely to engage in jingle mail? And third, which uh, <laughs> regionals are most exposed to those landlords? Thanks. Yeah. So um, somebody tell me what jingle mail is, because that sounds awesome. <laughs> so. you, you take your keys and you toss them in the mailbox. Oh, okay. you, you hand the building back to the lender. Uh, so it's kind of walking away. All right, Peter, yeah, what, um, what are your thoughts here? I mean, I, I actually think the biggest two factors for commercial real estate, let's just start broadly, okay, will be um, the the employment and the distribution of unemployment that emerges from uh, this slowdown. That's one thing. Second is the overall sort of uh, joblessness rate, joblessness rate in the United States. Insofar as with, if 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 credit losses and provisions start to have to creep up, then what will happen is credit will be repriced in a dramatic way, right? In other words, you will see spreads potentially blow out in in a very extreme situation. Um, I would say, to the best of my uh, knowledge. If you start with markets that have gotten terribly overheated for one reason or another, um, and I look at, for example, what happened with you know New York after the Japanese, you know, sort of uh, buying spree right in the in the eighties or eighties, um, and you sort of you know you kind of know when a market gets top ditched right. So I mean I think the famous example was when they bought our building right at Rockefeller Center. And, um, you know, the demise was calamitous. Every time, you know, companies build or countries build sort of the tallest skyscrapers like, out in, you know, uh, 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 in uh, J Jakarta or something like that, you, you also have, you know, similar sort of outcomes typically. In this case, I would say, you know, the Bay Area, because of the nature and the concentration of the employment, the rate at which it's falling apart, just say, right? um, the uh, ancillary and, and spillover effects to all types of local businesses. Um, it, it, and starting from a point of extremely low cap rates, uh, it, it could be very, very tough, very tough. Um, New York and some of the other metro areas, my guess is it will be more related to just what the jobless situation looks like after the settlement of say post COVID, right? In other words, what is the new natural demand of space needed for um, a reduced daily workforce, right? And if that workforce is uh, three days a week or four days a week, and if you determine that the fifth day week on average, you know, people, you know, maybe it's three and a half, four, you know, four days. But the, the fact of the matter is, it will be 
an impetus if you are going into lean economic times to cut costs any way you can. So you negotiate down your lease if you can. Otherwise, you you enter a sublet built sublease situation, or you you know, or you dispense with staff, or you do all three, right? All, all of the above. So I think what's going to happen is we need to see how this near recession evolves to know, let's just say, at, at a big metro area, what's going to happen. One thing I can say, though, is that it is highly likely in the Bay Area, for all those reasons, I conditions I, I pointed to, that that it's it's vulnerable, it's absolutely vulnerable to bad news. And even if it weren't to show up, let you know, right right away in some some transactions, um, absolutely, cap rates are going to evolve, right, to reflect expectations or some psychology that says that area is in trouble, right? So I think the cost of finance and the cost of capital naturally drives down the fair value of the properties for the, certainly for the current landlords. It's a question ultimately of, you know, who owns these things, right? So in some cases, it's insurance companies, in other cases, it's pension funds, and in some cases, it's 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 whole funds. And then last but not least, in many cases, it, it would be, you know, REITs, right? Um, and I imagine that if it resembles times past, there will be a bit of a shuffling of the deck amongst the natural buyers of real estate. So in other words, the ones who take losses you know, at this point, um, you know, it, it could involve some of the REIT properties because, of course, they're so, you know, uh, so uh, spread out and, uh, and ubiquitous. Um, the insurance companies, you know, that's that's a matter of, um, uh, I think, liquidity and sort of credit quality there. I actually think that insurance companies and pension funds don't have as much leeway to own as much commercial real estate as they once did. And therefore, you know, it is possible that they would not be immune from it, but certainly that it could be remain in the manageable category. The, uh, as for, you know, single funds and sort of, you know, highly levered properties, things like that, it's going to require, in some cases, recaps, right, and um, restructuring of both the debt and uh, renegotiating of the equity. I've seen situations where a where uh, whole bills have essentially gone into um, default, and then some bank that happens to own the mortgage ends up with the equity position, right, effectively, and and might do exceedingly well, even though they thought they were just making a straight loan, <laughs> but they end up, you know, basically taking taking under the asset at the lowest possible price. So, you know, but one thing I feel strongly about is that the the real estate markets, if you give it sort of three, four, five years, whatever turns into a fire sale, eventually there, there isn't enough money in the world, in my opinion, that is interested in commercial real estate uh, in the United States, dollar denominated, right? Um, to be interested, to be uh, absolutely interested in what we do. So you'd have to count up all the global investment in, in property to say, is there enough willingness and firepower there to do this? Um, I, I think it's very highly probable there would be uh, opportunities to refashion the investments um, with a little bit of musical chairs. Uh, and uh, But then in the interim, it, it could very well get painful if you have some slide in uh, the uh, the jobs numbers, especially it's concentrated in locale. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, 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 I, so, so, yeah. so yeah, let wanna... me let me just finish here because uh, I thought I thought uh, that Eric was going to ask the question that included the thing about balance sheets so we could get one in, but he went the other one. That's OK. I have one for Dodd, and then I'll hand it over to to to, to Weisskopf. Um, you know, one thing with this week, we are getting a ton of questions about financials and all kinds of things. You know, you oversee a whole sales team talking about all this and have an active manager overseeing finance. What are you hearing from advisors? Right, I mean, most of the people that are here today are advisors. What are you hearing in terms of questions, concerns? How are you putting it to bed? You know, just a little bit from from the relationship side yeah. of what we do in our world. Well, yeah, it, it certainly has been the, you know, number one pronounced uh, topic, uh, no surprise there, but uh, the phones have been ringing pretty much off the hook. Uh, and it's a lot of what we're discussing today. You know, it's it, it, the spillover, the implications, uh, you know, how specific was S, SVB and, 
signature and uh, in 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 how does that how does that impact? Um, the other question we're getting a lot, and we're not seeing people overly panicked, right? And I think when we have a conversation, share a lot of the points that Peter shared today, people have a, a good level of comfort, at least in our portfolios, because we're we're not in, you know, the 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 regional banks or the, the smaller players. Um, this is something I think that's been anticipated, uh, at least a possibility and the reason why we're allocated the way we are. Uh, so that's, that's, that's really where, you know, most of those questions are, um, and, you know, we, uh, we're long-term investors, so we, you know, don't get like things out immediately on things, but I think our perspective is very unique and different. So, uh, that's, that's really the questions we're getting mostly. So along those lines, um, I guess I, I would conclude by saying Dodd uh, Chris is coming out with uh, a call pretty soon do I have that right yes yeah uh, so related to the uptick in a lot of calls and questions on this uh, Chris is doing a call next Wednesday at two o'clock uh, we're literally just putting that together as we speak or the hour before so I don't have the actual dial-in information but it will be available I guess on our, our Twitter site, uh, as well as, you know, folks can reach out to, to me directly, uh, folks on the call, I know a lot of you, uh, and we'll forward all that information along, but there indeed will be a call Wednesday at two o'clock Eastern uh, that Chris will be uh, be hosting and uh, building upon, you know, a lot of the, the perspective that, that Peter shared. And Peter, I, you know, I guess the magical question is, um, you know, how long will we see this cloud overhanging and what signs might be encouraging that things are getting better? I mean, you just talked a bit about consolidation. You know, my mm -hmm. assumption would be that could be, that could be a positive, but it could be a negative too, if, if that you have a situation where it's a forced consolidation. Uh, that, that's possible. And I think that the, um, it, it's, it's a game of finesse to some extent, right? and uh, where you um, try to rationalize things to the, to the extent they need to be rationalized, but at the same time not cause further panic and create self-fulfilling prophecies to the negative. Um, you know, just because banks may change ownership at, over time does not mean that they have to be underserved uh, sectors locally in, in their geographies or in their, their product set. What it sometimes means is, you know, if I'm a big bank and I really wanted to go into San Francisco bigger, um, I probably pick up in some parlance both labor and also capital, right? Whether it's branch networks or anything else, um, I could probably pick up that type of exposure for much cheaper than going in and trying to build and compete with the uh, the players who once were very strong in that market, right? Um, I don't think that it's uh, it's not beneficial for there to be, uh, in my opinion, forced fire sales uh, to the extent you can you can you can change that. So that's one of the reasons why, without interpreting too much from it, I think a consortium of eleven banks together today, working on First Republic specifically, is a good precedent and it's a good model, right, for how to deal with things that don't just like in Tarp's case where we we forced all the major banks to take capital. We didn't create a penalty window, a penalty box for one single doubt versus another single doubt versus another single doubt. That could have easily pulled down, pulled on the string, right? So this idea of we're all in this together, the banking sector is going to, you know, put the the economy first. Um, that I think initially is is a very, very good uh sort of alliance to have uh, actively you know, talking to each other every day and working together. I think long term, the the effects could very well be um, at the margin employment, because if you do take over, let's say, a troubled bank, um, and however, you know, sort of orderly fashion you do it, um, you likely take on some bad assets and you likely take on some employees above your cost threshold, right? So there would be natural um, attrition in many cases of some of the employment picture. But I think that that's really, uh, to me, that that is probably the most um, important implication relative to, say, you know, the the well-being of certain communities, for example. 
you know, just the complexion of certain communities. You don't want to have a jobs, you know, problem there because then that voice, you know, major residential, you know, real estate problem on the local economy too. Um, so I don't think anyone wants the rails to, you know, the, the train to come off the rails to, to that extent. And if they did in, in certain instances, my, my hope is that it would be done not only in an orderly fashion, but hopefully in some type of, you know, reasonably, uh, you know, reasonable fashion too, from even the human dimension standpoint, but we'll see. Well, with that, we're going to conclude. Peter, thank you very much for joining us here today in the ETF Think Tank Dodd as well. Thank you very much. Cynthia, I don't think we have a uh, speaker next week, but hopefully we'll come up with We do. Wonderful. Next week, we're talking oh, we do. private equity. Yeah, we're doing private uh, timely. equity next week. That's right. I'm sorry. I'm glad but, you... Um, Peter, tell us one more time. I've loved you said it twice. Something about investing in financials is the art of the specific. I want to remember that sentence. So is that how it goes? I thought that was awesome. It absolutely. That's absolutely how it goes. You know, you can't broadly generalize about things. You can't apply a screen. Um, you certainly don't want to look at purely an index and what it's telling you, because that implies that market cap size is telling you what you need to know. Whereas what I told you before, which is more important, what is the embedded structural risk you're trying to alleviate? And that is not marked to market every day. Yeah, no, beautiful. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. This has been a phenomenal conversation. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming, joining us, asking your questions. And um, we will see you all next week. Great. Thank thanks, you. Guys. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Private everyone. Equity. Bye. Bye. <laughs>